the treatment of fungal infections, but in order to understand treatment, I'm also going to define some of the uh, fungal syndromes. So just as a, a brief outline today, we will talk about some of the types of antifungals as well as the most common types of invasive, invasive fungal infection, including cryptococcus, candida, some of the endemic mycoses, blastomycosis, histoplasma, coccidioides, and then um, some of the mold infections. We'll discuss a little bit about local versus disseminated infection, antifungal therapy, um, and then some general points regarding fungemia. Um, so there are three main types of antifungals, two of which act on the cell membrane, um, azoles and polyenes, such as amphotericin B, and those which act on the cell wall, um, echinocandins. Azoles inhibit the fungal cytochrome P453A enzyme, lanosterol 14A demethylase, um, preventing conversion of lanosterol to ergosterol. Uh, integrity of fungal cell membrane is therefore disrupted, and this leads to cell lysis. Uh, there are some general class effects of azoles. Some of the antifungals have more pronounced of these side effects than others, but in general, the azoles have a lot of drug interactions because of their effect on the CYP enzymes. Um, they all, except for isobuconazole, cause QT prolongation. We monitor for transaminase elevation. Um, some of them more than others, but again, a class effect is that they can cause hypokalemia. They can interfere with lipid metabolism, resulting in hyperlipidemia or hypertriglyceridemia. Um, the lipid metabolism, and then the next point, the adrenal insufficiency, hormone alteration, these are really something you only see in people that are on them for long periods of time. And then all of them can also cause abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. But again, some um, have these as more pronounced effects than others. To start with, we'll talk about fluconazole. Um, it is FDA approved for candida and cryptococcal uh, treatment, as well as specifically treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. Um, at, at doses more than 400 milligrams a day for long periods, it can cause alopecia. Uh, it has good uh, distribution to the prostate and the kidneys and the oral form is highly bioavailable, bioavailable. So you get the same levels with IV as you would with PO. It is a potent inhibitor of the CYP2C9 and CYP2C119 enzymes and a moderate inhibitor of CYP3A4. So we always try to monitor and check for those drug interactions. And this inhibition may last four to five days. Um, so you, you may have to, to have a delay before you see um, the resolution of those drug interaction effects. Um, the next one we'll talk about is isobuconazole. Uh, it is used for treatment of invasive aspergillosis and mucormycosis. It can be used for candida, although it's really not considered first line. It can also be used for cryptococcosis, blastomycosis, but does not have activity with fusarium. Uh, unlike the other uh, azoles, this is a really special effect of isobuconazole. It can shorten QT interval. Uh, it can also result in nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, hypokalemia, lower extremity edema, and then about 6% of patients get a flu-like reaction. It has poor CNS penetration, however, has been used in case reports. Um, it has excellent bioavailability, just like fluconazole, and again, we watch for those CYP interactions. Um, itraconazole uh, is approved for blastomycosis, histoplasmosis, aspergillosis, and sporotrichosis, but can also be used with cryptococcosis, although it's technically not first line for that. Um, the big effect that I want to point out here with itraconazole is that it can have negative ionotropy. Um, so this is something that is contraindicated with patients with systolic dysfunction. Specifically, it's interesting, they note for onychomycosis, but something to really think about um, with any of your patients who may have underlying systolic dysfunction. CNS penetration is poor. Um, really, the, the primary antifungals for CNS are voriconazole and amphotericin. Um, otherwise, you're, you're pretty limited with CNS coverage. There's some important uh, formulation considerations, including if a patient is given the capsule form, this has to be consumed with acidic foods, uh, whereas the lipid form must be consumed on an empty stomach. Um, Posiconazole, this is kind of our newest, uh, most kind of sexy antifungal. 
Um, it can be used for, uh, for FDA approval for aspergillus and candida uh, for infective prophylaxis in the setting of hematologic malignancy with prolonged neutropenia, such as in the setting of stem cell transplant or GVHD. However, we often use it, and there's more and more data about it being used in infections that are refractory to standard treatments, such as aspergillosis, histoplasmosis, coccidiomycosis, candidiasis, fusarium, and cetosporium. Um, the big adverse reaction is GI distress, and it requires a fatty meal for best absorption. Um, the next antifungal um, that we'll discuss is voriconazole. This is the primary treatment for aspergillosis, but it also has spectrum of activity in fusarium, cetosporium, apiosporum, and candidemia. It has excellent CNS penetration. It does not have urinary tract penetration. One of the big drawbacks though about voriconazole is that the pharmacokinetics are nonlinear. So there's great variability between patients. This is actually a problem with a lot of the azoles. Um, that's why it's important to check drug levels when once a patient has got to steady state. We see a little bit of that variability to be less of a factor with some of the newer azoles like posiconazole. Um, but it's definitely a player in therapy with boriconazole. Boriconazole has a lot of adverse effects, including visual disturbances in about 20.6% of patients, and this usually resolves after treatment. Um, neurotoxicity is something to also be concerned about. This is primarily seen with very high um, serum trough levels, and this can be reversed by dose reduction with hallucination in about 4.3% of of patients. Um, one that the boards really love to test is photosensitivity. Um, there is an increased risk of photosensitivity and skin cancers with long-term therapy with voriconazole, and the QT prolongation effect is more, more pronounced with this azole than with the others. Um, another, uh, another testable um, side effect of voriconazole is that it can cause uh, periostitis. There's a, there was actually a case report in the New England Journal of Medicine on this uh, that this picture was taken from. The other, uh, the other form of antifungals that act on the cell membrane are the um, polyenes, and the, the major antifungals in, in this class are amphotericin and liposomal amphotericin B. Um, they bind Q sterols in the cell membrane lining, which allows ions, particularly potassium and magnesium, to leak out, which alters fungal metabolism and function and can result in cell death. Um, Sometimes we think about our polyenes, the amphotericin, as kind of our broadest spectrum of action antifungal. Um, it has coverage for most candida species, most aspergillus species, excluding aspergillus terius, um, mucormycosis, blastomycosis, cryptococcus, coccidioides, and sporotrichosis. Um, the, big, the big adverse reaction that we find with the uh, polyenes are nephrotoxicity. Um, this can be reduced with pre and post hydration. Sometimes it's also called amphoterable because it can also cause a lot of electrolyte abnormalities. Um, it can be associated with an infusion reaction characterized by histamine release uh, resulting in phlebitis and it can also, prolonged use can cause anemia. Um, Echinocandins are our next antifungal. Um, these, these work on the cell wall, so a different site than the azoles and the polyenes. They inhibit the beta D glucan uh, synthesis by inhibiting the enzyme 1 3 beta BD glucan synthase, which is essential um, to cell wall integrity. So once this enzyme is inhibited uh, and the synthesis of the beta D glucan is stopped, the cell wall becomes permeable, which leads to cell death. Echinocandins are primarily used for the treatment of candida infections. Uh, most candida species have susceptibility to this antifungal. There is some action with aspergillus, but it only kills growing dividing hyphae of aspergillus, so it's fungostatic and not fungicidal and should never be used for treatment of aspergillus alone. Um, with the kinocandins, we primarily worry about hepatotoxicity, histamine release during infusion, and elevated transaminases. It has very poor CNS penetration, and it can also reduce clearance of cyclosporin, sirolimus, and nifedipine. Um, another, another antifungal that we're not going to spend too much time on, but is also used uh, specifically in the treatment of cryptococcal disease, is flucytosine. Um, which 
is taken up by fungal cells via cytosine permease and helps convert um, the, it helps, con it inhibits uh, fungal DNA RNA synthesis by basically acting or creating intermediates which act as inhibitors. Um, it interferes with protein synthesis after conversion of 5-FU intracellularly. Um, it has excellent CNS penetration and is used in treatment of severe cryptococcal disease, but is also approved for candida. And with this, we really worry about pancytopenia. Um, this is a concentration-dependent effect. We also worry about hepatitis, GI distress, and taste perversion. This is an important chart just because it's very easily testable. Um, these are the uh, types of fungus that have intrinsic resistance to various antifungal medications. So for amphotericin, aspergillus terius, cetosporium, trichos, yes, sorry, cetosporium, um, some trichosporin species, and candida lusitaniae all have intrinsic amphotericin resistance. With fluconazole, um, candida crucii, candida glabrata, some isolates, Candida norvgensis, Candida inconspicua, and Trichosporin asahi have intrinsic fluconazole resistance. And then Cryptococcus neoformans and Trichosporin asahi are intrinsically resistant to echinocandins. Um, mechanisms of resistance for the polyenes include the ERG3 gene mutation. Um, for the azoles, efflux by multidrug transporters, the ERG11 gene mutation. Um, and for echinocandins, mutation in FKS1 and FKS2 binding units, and for flucytosine, the FUR1 gene, one gene mutation, um, which results in a defect in cytosine permease and deaminase. Um, for fungal CNS infections, we primarily use amphotericin B. That's why a lot of um, disseminated fungal disease includes some induction period with amphotericin or voriconazole for CNS penetration, but the other antifungals have very poor um, CNS penetration. General risk factors for invasive fungal infection include renal failure, TPN, indwelling catheters, prior treatment with broad spectrum antimicrobials, diabetes, burns, steroids, chemotherapy. I put steroids again because it's such an important one. Um, organ transplant and immunodeficiency. Some of these are greater risk for some types of infections over others. Um, but from an internal medicine diagnostic perspective, just being aware of fungal risk with these conditions may help to broaden your differential, especially in a patient on antibiotics that isn't getting better. Um, candidemia, which is the most common type of fungal infection that all of us probably see um, can be caused by many different strains, Candida glabrata, Candida crucii, Candida albicans, Dubliensis, Candida auris, um, which is one we'll talk about in a little bit, um, Candida lusitaniae and parapsilosis. Um, as we all know, it's a yeast. Uh, it's usually a budding yeast, although glabrata does not bud. It is found everywhere. It's common skin and gut flora. Um, diagnosis can be made by culture, um, and treatment is generally first line is with an echinocandin, especially in the setting of invasive disease. But once you get susceptibilities, uh, if susceptible to fluconazole, you can switch. Um, the majority of candida bloodstream infections is caused by candida albicans, um, followed in descending order by glabrata, parapsilosis, tropicalis, dubliniensis, crucii, lusitaniae, guillermondi, and then the last 5% is just kind of a grab bag of all of the other different Canada subspecies. Um, it can cause local disease. This is definitely the most common in, the, in terms of thrush, vaginitis, balantitis, uh, and esophageal candidiasis. Disseminated disease uh, is something that we see in our ICUs in the setting of sepsis. Um, it, disseminated disease can also cause cutaneous manifestations as well as endophthalmitis. Um, hepatosplenic candidiasis is an important entity to consider, especially in your patients who may be on chemotherapy, um, who've had long periods of profound neutropenia, and then when their neutrophils recover and inflammation increases, can develop high spiking fevers. Um, and then this here, you see on imaging, uh, multiple lucencies in the liver, um, which are the manifestation of the um, hepatosplenic candidiasis. Uh, candidiasis can also cause invasive focal disease. This is probably in your patients that are not immunologically normal, such as endophthalmitis, meningitis, GU, osteoarticular, really, you name it, and there's probably a case report about it. Um, Candida auris is an important 
a type of candida that, about which we should all be aware. It was first identified in Asia, and it actually has a pretty high prevalence in India and Southeast Asia. It's considered transmissible, and if uh, if a patient is found to be colonized with it, it requires patient isolation, um, and it's really important to notify your infection prevention team uh, that a patient is colonized because it has been known to cause widespread outbreaks in hospital facilities and long-term care facilities. And the reason why this matters is that um, Canada Oris has a pretty high association with developing multi-drug resistant uh, infections. About 90% of isolates are resistant to fluconazole, 30% are resistant to amphotericin, and about 5% are resistant to echinocandins. Um, so your first line of treatment, if you suspect a Canada Oris infection, would be your echinocandins. Um, about 4 to 5% of isolates are pan-resistant, and these can be associated with really devastating infections. Um, uncomplicated candidemia is treated with echinocandins. Um, that's usually your initial therapy, as we discussed, although you can consider high-dose fluconazole if your isolate is susceptible. Uh, as some of you may know, when you're on service and we tell you, you call us and we tell you to get ophthalmology, every patient with candidemia needs to get a fundoscopic evaluation. This can generally be done about a week after initial diagnosis to rule out chorioretinitis or endophthalmitis. If persistent candidemia, um, you should consider an echocardiogram to rule out endocarditis and all central lines should be removed as well. Um, the guidelines also interestingly do comment that empiric antifungal therapy should be considered in critically ill patients with risk factors for invasive candidiasis and no other known cause of fever. Um, the way I like to think about this is let's say you have a hospitalized patient in septic shock with no obvious source on broad spectrum antimicrobials um, with multiple of these risk factors. So are they TPN dependent? Have they been on broad spectrum antibiotics? Do they have history of transplant or hematologic malignancy or some other conditions such as per GI perforation predisposing them to disseminated infection or end-stage renal disease? Um, if they have any of these things, then you can consider checking a beta D-glucan, although caveat, there's a lot of things that can cause false positives of that, but consider checking one and starting mycofungin and then reassessing within four to five days if your patient is showing improvement. Um, one thing that you also may have encountered as a industrious internal medicine resident on the floors is that when you call ophthalmology and you ask for an eye exam, they give you some pushback. Um, and this is an interesting question. A lot of the uh, papers about candida endophthalmitis that are referenced in the IDSA guidelines are some older papers. Um, there was a, a review in, or a, as a review of the evidence in JAMA ophthalmology within the last couple of years um, that was a meta-analysis of all available data. And one thing they found that I think was really interesting is that there's a difference between how um, endophthalmitis, the, what the diagnostic criteria were before 1994 and after 1994, so that um, if you're trying to justify the practice um, using newer data, there may be less evidence than if you are primarily looking at older studies. Um, what they comment upon is that there are these nonspecific chorioretinal lesions that can be common in patients with candidemia and in critically ill patients in general, so that some of those earlier studies may have been kind of overcalling um, endophthalmitis. Um, the reason why we still think this matters, though, is because, as we'll talk about later, systemic echinocandins, they don't have um, penetration into the eye. So the therapy really is different, and, and the risks benefits um, from the ID perspective of, you know, missing candida endophthalmitis, um, the risk of that is, is, to our perspective, greater than, you know, the benefit of just getting a fundoscopic exam because it really would change management. However, this meta-analysis did demonstrate no clear benefit from screening asymptomatic patients. Um, they found overall low incidence and that in general systemic therapy caused these nonspecific um, retinal lesions to resolve. Um, and you can see here, um, this is an interesting study. It compares the incidence of endophthalmitis by study year. 
um, the cumulative incidence of endophthalmitis was significantly higher um, among articles before 1994 when the stringent criteria for endophthalmitis were published compared with articles published after 1994. Um, incidence of endophthalmitis by definition of endophthalmitis is, is really what changed. Um, next, we will talk about histoplasma. Um, this is, so histoplasma is, is a commonly tested um, type of fungal infection on the boards. It really can be found absolutely anywhere. I think that when you read uh, PPID, the Infectious Disease Bible, they say it's everywhere but Antarctica. Um, there are two main strains, Histoplasmosis capsulatum and Histoplasmosis duboisi. It is a dimorphic fungi. Um, which I always think about, you know, yeast in the beast and mold in the cold. Uh, it looks like a narrow, narrow based budding ovoid yeast. Um, it can appear intracellular and is generally found from soil, bird or bat droppings and from inhalation of spores. Um, Bob Dylan actually was treated for histoplasmosis um, previously. So it has some cultural relevance as well. Um, despite being found everywhere, it, it has particular distribution in the Ohio and Mississippi River valley, valleys. Um, and diagnosis can be made by direct growth from BAL or blood, from cytology or histopathology. Uh, and what we often check are uh, histoplasmosis antigens, so either urine or serum. Um, the urine has a higher sensitivity. Uh, however, I would be careful in that there can be cross-reaction with some of the other endemic mycoses. So you have to take into consideration your patient, their risk factors, their epidemiology, in addition to these, um, these studies. Um, and serology can be done as well, but this also has um, cross-reaction and uh, there has a higher risk of false positives. Uh, in general, to uh, what uh, it is necessary uh, in controlling histoplasmosis to have a well-functioning immune system, um, and that this the immune uh, reaction to histoplasmosis in, in eliminating it is dependent on having adequate uh, interferon gamma um, and TNF alpha. So if you are on certain immunotherapies, such as TNF-alpha inhibitors, um, there is a higher risk of disseminated uh, histoplasmosis mm -hmm. infection. So the clinical manifestations of histoplasmosis are, are very wide in spectrum from asymptomatic, which is the most common with a normal immune system in which well-functioning macrophages are able to sequester the fungus and create um, you know, granulomas, but these will not necessarily cause disseminated or other widespread disease. Uh, symptomatic pulmonary uh, presents like community acquired pneumonia. This is a mild manifestation. If you have extensive exposure to histoplasma with high inoculation, this can lead to acute diffuse pulmonary disease. Patients with underlying lung disease can get a form called chronic pulmonary disease. Uh, a more Rare form would be bronchiolithiasis, in which calcified nodes erode into bronchi, um, granulosi and mediastinitis, in which uh, there is enlargement of mediastinal lymph nodes due to granuloma formation. And then the, the last is fibrosing mediastinitis, which is, is caused by later sequelae of uh, histoplasmosis. And this does not necessarily need treatment uh, with any specific antifungals. Uh, the degree of disease from all of these fungal infections, but right now we're talking about histoplasmosis, depends on both the immune system status of the patient and the degree of exposure. Um, disease can be acute or chronic, and chronic disease is more commonly found in patients with higher amounts of immunosuppression. In disseminated histoplasmosis, the most common uh, symptom is fever. Um, about 70% of patients also have evidence of lung disease, 60% weight loss, and hepatosplenomegaly. Um, and on labs, this also can present with pancytopenia, transaminase elevation. Uh, in very severe disease, it can present with shock. If you have a patient that has disseminated histoplasmosis but no known immunodeficiency and is not on any immunosuppressive medications, then you should consider a workup for immunodeficiency, including T cell subset quantitations uh, or evaluation for abnormalities in the cytokine pathways, because as we talked about, those are very important for immune control of the disease. Um, therapy for histoplasmosis is initially 
started with amphotericin B induction for one to two weeks, um, followed by itraconazole for at least 12 months. Um, in AIDS patients who have history of disseminated histoprophylaxis is recommended for CD4 counts less than 150 or in areas of high incidence. Um, you can consider longer immunosuppression, or, sorry, longer prophylaxis if a patient is on constant immunosuppression. Um, fibrosing mediastinitis, this is a more um, kind of delayed immune reaction to histoplasmosis and does not actually require any antifungal therapy. Um, in addition to HIV patients, you should also consider prophylaxis in your transplant or chronically immunosuppressed patients. Uh, one thing that I um, try to always think about is when you have patients on TNF-alpha inhibitors, um, these cytokines are so essential both to histoplasmosis, but really to all, uh, all fungal infections. And uh, histoplasmosis is actually the most common fungal infection in patients on TNF-alpha inhibitors. So definitely something to consider uh, as these therapies are expanded for the treatment of myriad autoimmune conditions. On um, blastomycosis, the primary strain that causes infection is blastomyces dermatitidis. Uh, it is a dimorphic fungi on pathology appears broad-based and budding. It's found in the soil and in wood. Uh, geographically, it's primarily seen in the southeast and south central U.S., bordering the Mississippi and Ohio River basins, the Midwestern states, and Canadian provinces, bordering the Great Lakes. Um, diagnosis can be made by culture or visualization. Serology can be used, but it has a very high degree of cross-reactivity um, with other en uh, endemic fungi. And the antigen uh, can also be used, the, the blasto antigen, but this also has cross-reactivity, especially with histoplasmosis. But again, the urine antigen has greater um, sensitivity than this serum. Like histoplasmosis, blastomycosis has a wide spectrum of disease, including asymptomatic, acute pulmonary, which again would present just like community-acquired pneumonia, chronic pulmonary, and then extra pulmonary. One thing to remember that makes blastomycosis unique is its predilection for um, skin lesions. This is the most common extra pulmonary manifestation of blastomycosis. There is a wide array of ways that these skin lesions can appear, including varicose, ulcerating, or nodular. Can also be associated with osteomyelitis. About 25% of extra pulmonary disease involves osteomyelitis. Um, and less common, much less common, would be GU or CNS disease. Um, treatment for mild to moderate disease is with itraconazole. Um, for severe disease, initially treatment is with amphotericin B, and then step-down treatment will include itraconazole. If CNS involvement, boriconazole is considered. Um, coccidioides is another uh, dimorphic fungi. Uh, it appears thick-walled and barrel-shaped. Um, transmission occurs when mycelium and soil are inhaled, um, and uh, th these infections, kind of the typical story is it's dormant when dry, but then after rain, it can be sporulate uh, and become more infectious. Spores are released into the air during any process which deserves soil, um, such as construction, farming, or earthquakes. Geographically, it's primarily found in the southwestern U.S. That's Arizona, California, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, Utah, and northern Mexico. Diagnosis, um, like the other fungi, can be by stain um, and serology. Um, if disseminated, you can also check urine or serum antigen tests. Uh, coccidioides, the most common manifestation is primary pulmonary coccidioides. 60% um, of patients have minimal or asymptomatic disease. Um, most common uh, most commonly, actually, interestingly, in endemic regions, it's responsible for about 20% of cases of community-acquired pneumonia. So this is definitely more of a regional thing. Um, valley fever is something that's commonly tested. And this is following the initial infection. There can be lingering fatigue, fever, joint pains. Um, it's oft also called uh, desert rheumatism. And incubation, incubation varies from 7 to 21 days from initial exposure. In more immunosuppressed patients, you may develop chronic infection or widespread um, disseminated infection, um, which really can involve any organ system. You can find case reports for pretty much anything. Treatment is generally with fluconazole or other triazoles for life-threatening disease, uh, amphotericin.
Mucor is a type of fungal infection that I think is definitely totally testable on the internal medicine boards. Um, the strains are Rhizopus mucor, Rhizor mucor, Cunningamella, Obsidia, Saxonea, and Apiphysomyce. Um, it is a filamentous mold, and the key word on tests is always ribbon-like and aseptate. It's ubiquitous in nature, especially soil, and it can pretty much be found everywhere. Um, one thing to note with mucor that sets it apart from some of the other fungal infections is that it has a negative beta D glucan. Um, and so this is something to consider that, you know, if you check a, a fungitel and it's negative, it rules out a lot of fungal infections, but not all of them, including um, mucor and crypto. Um, there are situational risk factors for infection, which include healthcare associated infections. There's actually case reports of infection being tied to adhesive bandages, construction, tongue depressors, and hospital linens. It can be combat associated. Um, there was a case series of blast injuries in Afghanistan associated with cutaneous uh, mucor infections and then natural disaster associated. Um, there was an outbreak of mucor infections following the tornado in Joplin, Mississippi. Um, some personal factors that can lead to increased risk of infection include diabetes. Um, this is a, a fungus that likes to thrive in high glucose environments. Um, also, treatment with deferoxamine um, can be associated with um, increased risk of this infection. Uh, steroids, malignancy, uh, stem cell transplant, solid organ transplant, iron overload, um, HIV, AIDS, IV drug use, history of trauma or burns, all of these can be associated with more severe infection. Um, this is just uh, to show you that there have been case reports of these outbreaks in places as prominent as the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I think the most testable manifestation is rhino orbital mucormycosis. Um, this is the typical case is your patient with very poorly controlled diabetes who presents with a sinus infection that hasn't resolved on antibiotics. Um, definitely something to consider. Um, these infections are angioinvasive, so they typically cause this kind of like necrotic um, appearance, as you see on this patient's soft palate. But disease is not just isolated to the sinus or the rhinoorbital area. There is also pulmonary disease, um, GI disease, and cutaneous disease caused by direct inoculation. If, if mucor is disseminated, it has a very high mortality. Um, and I personally have not treated a mucor patient that has survived. So it's definitely a very dreaded um, type of fungal infection. Treatment is initially with amphotericin B. The truth is we don't have other great step-down therapies and patients don't generally survive enough for this to be well studied. Um, but step-down therapy can be with posaconazole or isobuconazole, salvage, you can try the one that you tried previously that didn't seem to work. Um, for adjunctive management, you should really pursue aggressive surgical debridement. Um, this is necessary for the treatment of, of this disease and, and really any fungal disease. If somebody has a fungal infection and it is amenable to debridement, then debridement um, should be pursued. Some alternative therapies that are considered include uh, hyperbaric oxygen and deferocerox, um, but those, both of these are just kind of uh, hypothetical and experimental. There's not great data. Um, fusarium is probably not a tremendously um, important type of infection for you all to know about, not to minimize its importance, but it probably isn't as uh, as testable as the other types that we've discussed. Um, however, I, I do want to talk about it just because it's something to consider, especially in your profoundly neutropenic patients. It is a filamentous mold. Um, on mor its morphology, it appears like aspergillus with septate hyaline hyphae branching at acute angles. Uh, it can sporulate in tissue, so on pathology, you should look for both hyphae and yeast structures in the same sample. Um, it's also distributed in soil and plants and can be found pretty much everywhere. Um, of, of, of the fungal infections, uh, Fusarium actually has one of the higher rates of positivity on basic culture, even blood cultures. So definitely um, something to consider. Local infections include keratitis, onychomycosis, or skin infections with cellulitis, ulcer, or abscess. Um, disseminated infection is primarily seen in immunosuppressed patients with prolonged neutropenia. Um, 
if skin lesions are present, there's even a higher association with blood culture positivity. So these skin lesions with the necrotic center are important to, to look for. Treatment is initially with amphotericin B and then step down treatment with voriconazole. Some kind of theoretical adjuncts include GCSF. Um, debridement should also aggressively be considered with all of these fungal infections, but also with fusarium, especially if you have a fusarium abscess. Aspergillus is another, um, this is probably one of the more common types of fungal infections that, um, that we'll all encounter. And one thing to consider, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but for your boards, there's a really wide spectrum of disease that aspergillus can cause, cause from invasive disease to allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Um, the, the main strain that causes disease is Aspergillus fumigatus, but there's many, many strains, including Aspergillus niger, Aspergillus flavus. And then um, important to remember that Aspergillus terius has intrinsic resistance to amphotericin. It does a filamentous fungi. And then boards love to, to talk about the morphology and especially Aspergillus and mucor. And whereas mucor is ribbon-like and aseptate, Aspergillus is septate and branches at acute angles, 45 degrees. It can be found virtually anywhere. Um, diagnosis can be from culture staining, um, galactomannan and beta-D-glucan, and blood cultures have a very low sensitivity. So probably would not be the first way you should try to, um, to diagnose this. There's so many different forms uh, of aspergillus. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. This is more of a palm thing, to be quite honest, than an ID thing, but it's definitely testable on boards, often found in patients with underlying asthma or cystic fibrosis. And board questions, I feel like, love to talk about patients with asthma who don't seem to be getting better with basic asthma therapies and, in fact, seem to be getting worse. That's when you really should think about um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Um, as far as the other manifestations of aspergillosis, they can range from an aspergilloma or just a fungal ball um, to widespread disseminated disease. On imaging, um, you often see the halo sign, and this is really the um, kind of like the penumbra of, of ground glass opacities around a more focal opacity caused by um, tissue infarction, and also the air crescent sign, which is really the, you know, the the kind of darker area you see around more of like a fungal ball caused by a cavitating lesion. Um, risk factors include immunocompromise, um, glucocorticoids, and patients with neutropenia or your solid organ transplant patients. Definitely um, something to think about at this hospital given all of the liver transplants that we do. Um, all of these are risk factors for aspergillosis. Uh, treatment for invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, the preferred agent is voriconazole, although there was recently a paper in Lancet that found non-inferiority with posaconazole. Um, the IDSA guidelines have not yet caught up to that, but I think it's something definitely to consider with treatment because, as we talked about, voriconazole has those very unreliable pharmacokinetics in, in different patients um, due to some CYP polymorphisms. So even though it says voriconazole, I think that we all should be thinking more and more about posaconazole for aspergillus treatment. Alternatively, you can use amphotericin. Um, some, some places, some infectious disease physicians like to do dual therapy with voriconazole plus an echinocandin. If you remember, um, echinocandins have fungostatic activity to aspergillosis, but the truth is there really isn't great data supporting that practice, but definitely in the setting of severe disease, it can be kind of a Hail Mary treatment approach. Aspergillomas or aspergillus nodules can be just observed um, or surgery can be undertaken, but they don't necessarily need any intervention. Um, cryptococcosis. This is another very testable fungal infection. Um, I, the boards like to talk about this infection in relation to your AIDS patients um, with very low CD4 counts. Um, there are a couple different subspecies, including neoformans and gadii. Um, the gadii was associated with 
um, crypt intracranial cryptococcomas, specifically in the Pacific Northwest in immunocompetent patients. Um, that's something that could be testable, but if I were a betting person, I would bet that your boards would test you on um, an HIV patient, an AIDS patient presenting with headache. Um, and then on LP with India ink stain is found to have these encapsulated yeasts. Um, source is wild birds and pigeons. Um, Cryptococcus can be found pretty much anywhere, but with uh, Cryptococcus gadii primarily being found in Africa, Australia, and the Pacific Northwest. Um, India Inc., I feel like even though we don't do this as much, it definitely is kind of like the board's question diagnosis for Cryptococcus. We also check CSF PCR and CSF antigen, um, and it's very important to, if you suspect a patient of having uh, cryptococcal meningitis, to do a lumbar puncture and look for elevated opening pressure. Um, I feel like this data is a little bit archaic, but one source I read mentioned that 70% of AIDS patients with cryptococcal meningitis have an opening pressure greater than 200. Um, maybe less now, but um, definitely the, the pathognomonic test question. Um, the manifestations of cryptococcus are, again, wide in spectrum from meningioencephalitis to cryptococcal pneumonia to asymptomatic disease. Um, cryptococcus gadii, this is specifically associated with these very impressive um, cryptococcomas. For treatment of cryptococcosis, uh, initial induction therapy is with amphotericin B and flucytosine for two weeks, followed by a consolidative therapy with fluconazole, 400 milligrams for a minimum of eight weeks, followed by maintenance therapy with fluconazole, 200 milligrams daily uh, for one year. In transplant patients or your chronically immunosuppressed patients, you should consider suppressive fluconazole um, for at least six to 12 months following completement of the um, consolidative therapy and maybe even lifelong if their source of immunosuppression is not able to be removed. Um, for your patients who had an elevated opening pressure on initial lumbar puncture, you may have to consider daily lumbar punctures or a VP shunt um, because of, of the degree of elevated intracranial pressure. Uh, for patients with AIDS, who present with cryptococcal meningitis, retroviral therapy should be delayed um, two to 10 weeks due to risk of iris. Pulmonary cryptococcus can be treated with fluconazole alone. Just a general note about fungal testing is that there can be a lot of different cross-reactivity with different antifungal serology tests and uh, fungal antigen tests. And the sensitivity of the test is based on the source of the culture, you know, whether it's blood or urine or the source of the sample in the setting of antigen testing or um, serology testing, but also on the patient status. Um, you would have to look at each different test and look at the data for each different patient. But I think it's just another reminder for all of us that in, in making a diagnosis, if you have high enough suspicion but a test is negative, it may be that that test doesn't have um, as high sensitivity in your specific patient. Let's say they're a transplant patient or a hematologic malignancy patient. Something like a um, antigen test may have different sensitivity in those two different patients. So just important to maintain your clinical judgment in addition to um, utilizing tests in an intelligent way. As far as serology goes, in addition to cross-reactivity, it can take time to de develop. So if you have very high suspicion for one of these infections, then you may um, consider rechecking the serology after a week or two to see if the, um, if the levels have risen or not. Um, the, the fungitel or the beta D glucan, um, this is a test we often will kind of order it just to see if we should stop or continue mycofungin most commonly. Um, it, it is negative with mucormycosis and cryptococcus. And this is something that's important to remember both for tests, but also just clinically. Um, it has a pretty high sensitivity and specificity, but it's not 100%. And there can be false positives um, with hemodialysis catheters, prior treatment with IVIG, albumin, um, cellulose for the IV. If a patient had an abdominal surgery and has a lot of gauze packing, um, and even some antibiotic formulations such as IV unison, although um, this specific reference did not include IV unison in the United States. But I would definitely focus on false positives coming from some of these other things, including gauze packing, um, albumin, and hemodialysis. 
catheters. And there are also some bacteria that can um, make beta D glucan, such as uh, Pseudomonas. Um, so important to think about all the causes of false positives. Galactomannan, um, this is a polysaccharide in the aspergillus cell wall, and this is another, um, another test that we may, may check to either rule in or rule out this disease. It has a sensitivity of about 82% and a specificity of about 81%. It generally performs better with patients with hematologic malignancy uh, and does not perform as well in solid organ transplant patients. And sensitivity can be decreased if on therapy. So let's say you empirically start someone on therapy and then in a few days want to check the galactomannan and it's negative, but they're on therapy. You should definitely consider that um, in coming to your final diagnostic conclusions. There can also be cross-reaction uh, with other fungal infections, including fusarium, penicillinum, and histoplasmosis. And false positives can be seen um, with zosin, um, GVHD and blood transfusions. And there's some data that it may be less helpful in children, but I am not a pediatrician, so I can't speak more to that. Um, in pregnancy, the only point of this slide is for you to remember that amphotericin B is always the drug of choice, especially in the first trimester during organogenesis. It's really the only antifungal that's well studied, which I think is kind of a bummer for pregnant women because it's also the most toxic. So. Um, if anybody's interested in doing studies, I think this is an area that needs some more research. But it's difficult because, of course, the azoles, which influence um, cholesterol synthesis, that can also be really important for cellular development in a developing uh, fetus. A 60-year-old woman presented with a headache, fevers, and altered mental status. Her husband reported that she had been unwell two weeks earlier with fevers and dry cough, which resolved spontaneously. She had returned three weeks ago from a four-week trip to New Mexico. She normally lived in Chicago. She had no significant past medical history. She denied smoking and drank alcohol occasionally. She lived on a farm with two dogs and 10 chickens. On exam, her temperature was 38.4, pulse 90, blood pressure of 88 over 58, and a respiratory rate of 18, a pulse ox of 95% on room air. Her head CT was negative, and let's see, lumbar puncture, opening pressure is 18. CSF white count is 60 with 80% uh, mononuclear cells. Glucose was 20, protein was 90, blood culture is negative, HIV negative. What do you think is most likely to be diagnostic? Um, CSF coccidioidal antibodies, CSF cryptococcal antigen, serum histoplasma antibodies, or urine histoplasma antigen? CSF uh, coccidioidal antibodies. And the, the keys in this question, I'm going to go back to it so you can see, because this is um, the board questions. If they're going to test on fungal infections, probably will be the endemic mycoses. Um, the, the points to look at in this question are the endemic exposure, um, the travel, and then the biphasic presentation with initial respiratory illness that revol resolved spontaneously, followed by dissemination to extrapulmonary sites. Um, so, the uh, the coccidioidal antibodies have a higher sensitivity than the coccidioidal um, antigen. 35-year-old developed fungemia with Canada parapsilosis doing a prolonged hospital course in the ICU with non-ischemic heart failure. Her central lines were removed, surveillance cultures were negative, and echocardiogram was unrevealing. She was treated initially with caspofungin followed by fluconazole uh, once speciation and sensitivities returned and then two weeks later she lost vision in her right eye. A dilated eye exam revealed fluffy vitreal lesions. She had an urgent vitrectomy with intravitreal antifungal injection. What systemic agent would be preferred for treatment? Answer here um, is actually voriconazole. As we discussed, voriconazole has better CNS penetration than the other azoles. Um, her course is describing the natural course of endophthalmitis uh, rather than a treatment failure and that it can appear after someone's already been on, on systemic treatment. Again, remember, um, the kinocandins do not have good um, CNS penetration or, or ocular penetration. And usually in endophthalmitis, patients will also get intravitreal injections. A 40-year-old man developed neutropenic fevers, um, right toe redness, and multiple skin lesions. He'd received an allergenic stem cell transplant two months earlier with no neutropenic recovery for relapsed acute uh, myelogenous leukemia despite multiple chemotherapy 
sorry, chemotherapy regimens. He lived in Chicago, Illinois. On examination, his temperature was 39.8 degrees centigrade. His right toe was erythematous and tender, and he had multiple tender nodular skin lesions with erythematous bases scattered over his trunk and extremities. Um, an MRI of the right toe showed bone erosions in a skin biopsy culture grew fungal colonies on lactophenol blue, which is a type of fungal stain um, as appearing in the following image. Biopsy specimen on GMS showed septate and branching filamentous hyphae with evidence of angio invas invasion and fungal blood cultures grew mold. So I think the key in this question is that the fungal blood cultures um, grew mold. As we talked about this infection, the answer here is fusarium um, has a higher rate of positivity on straight blood cultures than, um, than other fungal infections.